integral theory. So I have a quote here from one of my mentors, Hokai Sobel. Some of you might know him. Um, and is, he had a, I don't know, this is a tweet, something like this, uh, that said, don't worry, it's just everything and everyone happening all at once. To this day, I love that quote. There's something that tickles me and makes me relax in the um, face of complexity and overwhelm and chaos. But um, I share this quote because one, this sort of points to like some wisdom of waking up, of relaxing in, in the presence of everything happening, touching into something deeper that we can rest in. And it points to the usefulness of things like integral theory um, about how do we make sense of everything and everyone happening all at once. It's quite enormous. So we're going to do a little bit of that today. And that's um, integral theory is just one of uh, the ways that we can explore the complexity of the human experience in reality. But it is one of the um, longstanding meta maps and meta theories of the human experience. The other quote here, uh, Vince shared this the other day on Twitter, a quote from Dogen, do not be absent-minded in your activities, nor so absorbed in one aspect of a matter that you fail to see its other aspects. This is also standout for me when talking about integral theory because especially the second half, so, not so, so, so absorbed in one aspect of a matter that you fail to see its other aspects. So an integral theory, when we, what we're gonna look at today is sort of, if you've ever seen those balls that collapse on themselves and you can pull it apart and you, and you can collapse and pull apart, um, this is allowing us to pull apart and see the various aspects so that we would even know that we might be absorbed in one aspect over another. And we're gonna explore that through some distinctions of integral theory. So integral theory, a few basics here for those of you who are brand new. It's uh, created by Ken Wilber, philosopher. This is Ken here, one of his most recent pictures. He, his big book was Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, and that was published in 1999. But since then, he's obviously, um, as you would expect, continually evolving integral theory. And probably his most complete updated version is in Religion of Tomorrow, which is very relevant to this course. Uh, or training. So uh, feel free to look at that if you really want to go another deep dive. And the um, interview that I did with him on Buddhist Geeks, which is a classic Ken uh, deep dive marathon for a couple hours, um, hits upon a lot of things from Religion of Tomorrow and his most updated version of integral theory. So for me, it's a map of human experience, and you could call it a meta map, a map of maps. So and we'll see what that means uh, in a minute and why that's helpful. And he has this uh, phrase that everyone is right, at least partially, which is really fascinating to consider. Um, that everyone is at least right a little bit. Uh, probably also wrong, <laughs> but there's something to offer. So uh, that's a standout phrase for me. I want to talk about first, before we get into the actual components of integral theory of uh, why is this useful? So why are we talking about this? Is it just to have a heady conversation and, you know, enjoy some theoretical back and forth? For me, it's practically useful. And again, I think this training is a representation of that. We're going to be practicing every week, continuing to practice inside of this sort of integral framework. Um, but trying to apply it to our lives and apply it in response to the world and in response to the meta crises. So as I mentioned last week, the phrase that came up for me is what's happening here matters. And as I mentioned as well, that uh, we are trying to respond to reality, to life on its own terms and get to know very specifically as much as we can what's happening to make the most sense out of it so that way we, we can respond, that we can have a, the most wise, most skillful, compassionate response we can have. So that's the spirit in which I like to explore integral theory and share it with you today. And I think this also provides us more room to talk about our experiences. 
kind of how he's giving you an example of those expanding balls that collapse and uncollapse. We have more room to uncompress what we might otherwise collapse in our experience continually. We're able to at least see it and question it and wonder about it. And that's an experiential component. So where does my attention go? What dimensions or aspects of the human experience am I most interested in? Which aspects do I tend to ignore? Which aspects of the human experience do I, am I really ignorant about that I don't know much about, but are equally, integrally a part of this shared human experience? So an integral theory map like what we're going to explore today helps us to explore that inquiry. Without it, that can be very difficult because we're going to use our own frame of reference continually, and it's going to be a little harder to see what we can't see. Also, what I love about uh, a map like Integral is that it connects us more. If we're really opening up to what this is showing us, it's incredibly obvious how much we need each other because no person can possibly cover the breadth and depth of the human experience in any, I mean, period, let alone in really intelligent ways. Um, so this is another reason why it's uh, practically useful, not just theoretical. So um, last, what I would say in summary is that we could be less partial in our response and more inclusive um, in, in the sense of our comprehension, in the sense of our responsiveness to life, less partial, more comprehensive. And in terms of our lived experience, we are less fragmented and more whole, more embodied, more integrated by including consciously more of our human experience, working with it consciously. So uh, last couple of things here. Uh, this is really for your consideration. This is not prescription prescriptive. This is not a map that says absolutely. This is how everything is no debate, anything like that. Um, but it's also presented in a way that I don't consider this trivial or arbitrary. There's a lot about this map that I find incredibly useful that seem to point to lived truths. So I'm sharing it with that, uh, in that spirit. Um, Again, it's not exhaustive, so um, it's not saying that literally everything is going to be covered in here, although I think a lot of times Ken will present it with that way. Uh, the, one of his books is called A Theory of Everything, so, <laughs> you know, it's pretty bold. And in that sense, it's true that it's like, we, yeah, we are trying to have a theory of everything in this practical way we've been talking about, um, but, okay, it's, it's fine that it's probably not including literally everything in details and acknowledgement but that doesn't render this useless either, even if it's non-exhaustive. So, uh, here we go. These are the five core elements, five core components of integral theory. Quadrants, levels, lines, states, and types. And we're gonna explore each of these today. That's our main focus, is exploring each of these bits here. This, there's a lot more to integral theory. There's a lot of nuances um, and refinement in unpacking the complexity that each of these point to. But my goal here today is to help you feel like you have a strong orientation and foundation in each of these elements such that you can then dive more deeply. And of course we will be doing diving more deeply together over this training. So here we go, quadrants. So there are four quadrants. And there are different ways to talk about it. Um, so here we see I, we, it, and its. And we'll just talk briefly about these different ways of talking about these quadrants. Again, these, are, these quadrants represent dimensions of you know, the human experience. And some of these descriptors might resonate with you more immediately than others. But what we can say, I, we, and it, these are also called the big three in integral theory, but they're Four, because there are its as well. And this is, to me, the most immediate, relatable way of describing these, because we can say, well, I'm an I, for sure. I exist, I am here, I have thoughts and feelings and desires. 
we're also a we right now we're on this training together and we're a we exploring this together we're we's in our families we's in our societies we's in nations we's in uh the the earth there's also an it dimension for example the body we talk about the body often as an it and there are also plural it's more than one it it's and these are um exterior systems and we're going to see examples of this so i'm kind of giving you the language and then we'll look at a few examples the other way of looking at this is individual and collective so we see i and it is individual we and it's are collective and then interior and exterior so let's keep going here to unpack that um skip that slide so i in terms of uh, subjectivity, the interiors of my individual experience, thoughts, emotions, memory, states of mind, perception. So a lot of what we do in meditation is working with the interiors of our individual experience. And an important thing here about these quadrants is that every quadrant has to be dealt with or experienced and responded to on on its own terms. So like in terms of the interior experience, like meditation, there are maps of awakening. There are injunctions, practical injunctions that if you repeat these experiments in meditation, you have predictable interior experiences that are described solely from the interior that cannot be described from the exterior. You can scan my brain and know I'm having a thought, but you can't know uh, what my thoughts are. So um, this is an example of how we're going to differentiate, differentiate between I and it. Um, now, on the same token, if, you, if I'm having some sort of condition with my brain, neuroscience is going to help me with that. Neuroscience can tell us a lot about the functioning of the brain, how the, the biology of the brain works. And only as, many, as much meditation I can do, it will never tell me how to operate on a brain <laughs> and what the different parts of the brain do. That's not happening. And yet both of these are important, right? They're both important. At this point in our human evolution, I th it's, it's usually pretty obvious. Usually, I don't think there's many people these days who are so staunch to ignore one and say like, oh, I don't like medicine or neuroscience. Forget all that. No. But it's important because sometimes uh, what can happen with these quadrants is we can collapse them or reduce them called reductionism. So I want to reduce everything to interior. Like, so anytime we have a conversation about the human experience, I'm going to go to interiors because that's my preferred space. I like dealing with interiors. I like dealing with meditation, with emotions, you know, so um, it might be with meditation, psychology, whatever it might be. It's like, that's where I like to live. And so I'm going to tend to collapse and ignore um, the exterior. Same token, this can happen where science can collapse our interior experiences, consider them irrelevant, right? That they don't matter, but the only thing that matters is what's happening in the body. That's the only thing real. The only thing that's real is what I can see through whatever manner, you know, if it, whether it's a microscope or some powerful telescope, like that's what's real. And if I can't see it, then it's not real. But that's not true. It, it seems to be not true. Similarly, um, if we go to the collective, we have we and its. So on the we side, we have things like shared values, meanings, language, relationship, uh, sociocultural aspects. Um, and these are the interiors of the we. Again, that these we's, like for example, shared values that we have, that it, you can't know what we share unless you talk to us. You're not going to be able to sit back completely on the exteriors of a, of a collective or of a we and know what's going on for them in terms of their shared meaning. They have to engage with that group, with, our, with each other. And in terms of its interobjective, these are systems, technology, uh, governmental systems, uh, economy, things like that. These are things we can objectify and measure, but they are systems. They're not like individual instances. It's an entire system. We can also consider these quadrants re related to some of the meta crises. For example, if we look at crisis of meaning, where are we likely to first look at for these quadrants? For me, I look to the upper left quadrant up here, the subjective 
of how do I make meaning and sense out of the world, but also how do we make sense and meaning out of the world? So if there's a crisis of meaning, it doesn't mean that these other quadrants aren't going to be related and in, 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 uh, impacting our meaning making, but meaning happens in these uh, left-hand side quadrants in the interior. Meaning is an interior. You can't see meaning floating out in the forest, right? Uh, a, there's this, can be, we can talk about a crisis of health. And, you know, for example, health and healthcare. So health is in the it category, right? People's bodies, our bodies, and how we are feeling physically and the support systems that are there or lacking to help us to be healthy. And that, that health system is an it's. How does this health system function, you know, to support the health, our health? We um, can talk about, obviously, the crisis of climate. And this will be on, for sure, on the surface, it's, a, it's an exterior crisis. It's, a, it's a, the ecosystem, right? Now, of course, because all these quadrants, there's, here's a phrase I'm going to drop on you from Ken. These quadrants are tetra-rising. That's a fancy word to say kind of what I mentioned at the beginning from Hokai. Don't worry, it's just everything and everyone happening all at once. That's what that means. All of this is happening at once. These, these quadrants aren't happening in sequence. You know, they're all true and present at the same time in our experience right now. And so if we talk about a crisis of climate, it's, uh, we're dealing with the system. You know, we're dealing with our, the uh, ecological system of the planet. And yet, guess what? We've kind of determined that we, in my opinion, we have plenty of answers to solve the exterior <laughs> uh, problem of this, but we're having trouble, for example, in the we quadrant of getting on the same page. We might have troubles with other systems like political systems in order to address climate change. So we can take any of these crises and examine them from each quadrant and see what it reveals, see what challenges we notice and see um, what insights we can uh, glean from, from taking these perspectives of quadrants. And when we're talking about something as complex as these crises, we can see how quickly it, it, it can happen where we bias and favor one quadrant, where we just miss the rest of the quadrants and how complex these crises are and how much we really need this full, a more full spectrum of understanding the human experience. So these are the quadrants. Um, a lot more we can explore in there, but hoping that makes some good sense. So now we're gonna move on to, I'm gonna go to lines of development. Often it, it, it's the, this is taught with stages first, levels of development before lines, but I think lines are pretty easy to understand. I can, we can call these lines of development also in lines of intelligence, depending, like if we're talking about, say, the upper left uh, quadrant, lines of capabilities. So I want to throw out words that you might be able to resonate with so you can kind of start orienting yourself. But here we're looking at the upper left lines of development. And you can see that there are different lines of development, cognitive, emotional, interpersonal, psychosexual, moral, spiritual. We can also throw out things like musical line of development. Uh, kinesthetic line of development. Again, here what we're doing is everything and everyone is happening all at once, and here we're allowing some space to kind of differentiate. Um, what is our experience of these different lines? Do we have the same, do I have the exact same experience across all these lines of development? No, we're all gonna be a little different in terms of our experience in a line of development. Um, now, there are gonna be a lot of theories and a lot of maps for, ev for each of these lines of development. And they might not, they're not gonna agree. They're not gonna describe everything the same. They're not, when we get into the stages of development, they're not going to um, agree on the same stages. But what's most important to me is the acknowledgement that these, can, things, these lines of development exist, that there are more, there's more than one line of development. One perfect example of this is between cognitive and moral. So we can see in the human history that we, we as a species and, and individuals have developed incredible cognitive capabilities. For example, building a nuclear bomb, right? You, you can't build a nuclear bomb without incredible cognitive development. 
but it doesn't mean you have incredibly high moral development or inc incredibly deep inclusive moral development, right? So people take, um, they, use, they can use their cognitive development to cause serious harm. And that is the discrepancy between these lines of development. It, it doesn't seem to be the case that if you develop uh, incredible cognitive capabilities that you're automatically developing moral capabilities. And that's true for all these other lines of uh, uh, development. Um, also, when in this training um, and in integral theory, we talk about these four facets of waking up, cleaning up, growing up, and showing up. These are areas of practice, but we can also get a sense of our own experience in uh, waking up, cleaning up, growing up, and showing up. How are we doing? We can check in with ourselves right now. And at any point in our lives, so we may be shifting. So there were times in my life where I was really focused on waking up. And then times in my life where I was focused more on cleaning up, more on showing up. So again, just having these lines in front of us can help catalyze some reflective insight and then um, to influence and catalyze our response. What are we doing in the world? What are we practicing? Why are we practicing it? All right, now let's go to stages of development. Check out my time here. Okay, so stages of development, honestly, this is like the one that I find can be the most com complex to talk about. It can be also bring up a lot of reaction and debate, um, but it's a core component of integral theory. For me, it's one of the most overlooked aspects um, in the world right now. If you listen to my talk with Ken Wilber, he, for, for him, uh, in, the meta, in response to the meta crises, he's uh, said that basically growing up was like the thing that he, if he had to pick one thing, it was gonna be growing up, that practice of growing up, and growing up has to do with uh, growing and deepening in developmental stages. So when we just talked about moral development, here in this uh, lower left quadrant, you see basically that kind of development. Me, us, and all of us. This is a very simple version of a moral line of development. So at first I care about mostly me, then I care about not just me, but a particular version of us. That us could be family, that us could be, um, you know, religious community, it could be a city, it could be whatever, but there's an us that's, there's an us and then there's a not us, right? And then this uh, next stage is all of us. So even though I might be part of different we's, different us's, um, I'm including all of us. And this moves towards a world centric orientation to the world, not just a sociocentric or ethnocentric, for example, moving from my country to all of us. And in the face of a meta crisis, a global crisis such as the climate change, it's pretty hard to imagine how that's going to be solved without more and more of us uh, orienting to the world uh, as all of us, as a world-centric sort of uh, morality and response. So with stages of development, a few notes about them. Uh, again, they represent growth and milestones in a line of development, and people you can totally divide these up in different ways and, and theorists will do that. Practitioners will do that. Um, they represent greater depth and complexity, greater embrace, and they include what came before. So for example, this me, us, all of us, it's not that we go to us and then we forget about me, like who cares? No, you're going to still include your own survival, your own health, you know, but now you're also including other people. These uh, stages are considered permanent, that you have permanent access to them. Once a stage unfolds in your experience, you have access to that. So you can see this sort of in other examples like language development. Once you have acquired a language at a certain level, you just have that language. You know, as kids, we, we it's funny. It, on one hand, you could say it's slow development, but really kids learn language incredibly fast. It's amazing. Um, and once they have that complexity in the, in the line of language development, they just have it, right? And the only thing that can really prevent, uh, change that, you can have these, for example, uh, a brain injury could change one's um, ability to, to speak. But generally speaking, without some catastrophic 
um, experience, you, you keep access to these stages of development. Other examples, if you want to get more simple, is like an acorn to an oak tree. This is an example of stage development that an acorn, you know, will grow into an oak tree and, all, and the oak tree doesn't flash out of existence and become an acorn all of a sudden in some weird, you know, circus of mirrors thing. You know, it's like, no, it's holding steady, you know, and, that, and it goes in one direction. Atoms to molecules to cells to organisms, again, greater and greater complexity. We talked about the moral. In um, the its category, we can talk about, um, I, I forget what this line of development's called here, but foraging, agricultural, industrial, and informational. If you really look at these, they, you need each one for the other one to unfold. But we can see through our, our human history that these have unfolded more or less in kind of that order. Group, nation, global, another example of stage unfoldment, unfolding. Three turnings as we talked about. This is an example of a stage uh, unfolding. Uh, one theorist we'll talk about later during the growing up week, Vince is gonna lead that one, but Robert Keegan is one that um, we reference a lot. Not enough time to get into Robert Keegan <laughs> today, but I'll, we'll share references. Um, all right, moving on. States of consciousness. Oh, no, this is another thing. States of the conscious. There we go. So states of consciousness are pretty easy, especially for meditators. Um, states of consciousness are different than stages in that they are accessible to all of us all the time. Examples are waking, the waking state, the dreaming state, and deep sleep, deep formless uh, sleep. Um, so it doesn't matter stage of development. It doesn't matter anything. You, we all have access to these states. Um, but states come and go. We do not permanently abide in a state. Um, meditative states are included here. So like concentration, jhanic states. These are states. Side note, this is why also um, you can see sometimes in the spiritual path, we can be led astray where we're trying to maintain some sort of permanent state, which is not going to happen. States change. That's what they do. Um, but sometimes we get into an effort of trying to like double down and, and maintain a state. If I can just maintain the state, everything will be okay. But states change. Um, but you know, these states, our experience changes, how our experience of the world changes. So like when we're asleep, uh, for example, and we're dreaming, the body is totally shut down. Body is on autopilot. We have no sense of that. We don't really have a sense of what's going on around us. We're in a different world and how the mind works and what's happening in there is completely different than our waking state. I'm not going to cover that too much because, again, in this group, I feel like that's pretty, you, you all are going to be very familiar with states of consciousness. Um, types. So this is uh, kind of the last bit of the main components. I've always found that it's held a little bit loosely with like, that's been my uh, experience with kin and then the integral community. It definitely seems relevant and useful to consider, but it doesn't feel as powerful as the other components. But an example is the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator in BTI or the Enneagram. Uh, this is considered horizontal, meaning that they can exist at any stage of development. Okay, so to give you an example, in Myers-Briggs, one of the typologies is between extroversion and introversion. And you know, at this point, I think our, we probably got a lot familiar with these terms, but I'm an introvert. By default, I'm an introvert. I, I need time alone to recharge versus some other friends I have. They recharge by being around a lot of people. When I'm, out of, when I'm around a lot of people, it takes more energy for me. Um, this is just a typology. It's just how I've been. It doesn't matter my whole life. This is kind of how I am. And yeah, INFP. Yeah, I'm an INFP as, my, um, as well. I thought that I was an INTJ way back in the day, but that's because a lot of theorists, like Ken Wilber's INTJ, so I was wanting to be an INTJ. And then I humbly found out that I'm like, no, that's just not me. So what I like about this is about MBTI and the Enneagram is it's sort of just, especially emotionally and relationally, it opens up some new perspectives. And one thing that opened up for me is a differentiation between introversion and other things like social anxiety. I used to experience a lot of social anxiety. So I was both introverted and socially anxious. 
but these are two different things. And for me to be able to see that and see a typology was really helpful. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty straightforward on types. So these are the five main components. So much more to talk about. And obviously Ken's written huge books on these, <laughs> let alone getting into just hands-on with anything in like say any of the quadrants, uh, we can really go to town. A few things I want to say to wrap up though is um, there's no need to see any of this as being absolute and complete, but hopefully this provides a lot of food for thought in examining our shared human experience. Again, to encourage you all to notice where are your strengths? Where do you gravitate towards? Where do you, yeah, where do you spend your time in terms of the quadrants or in terms of lines of development? Um, where might you be biased? Where might you, what might you ignore in everything that we talked about? Um, I think there's also something interesting and in, especially in working with some folks who are explicitly inter interested in integral is after you have these components, let alone, it could be other components, not that we haven't talked about today, maybe from other maps. Sometimes we can continue to compartmentalize these aspects. So for example, I wake up over here, I clean up over here. That's interesting. So we say, oh, both of these are important. Waking up is important, cleaning up is important, but I can't see how these two relate and integrate. And again, if we're gonna say that, use that fancy word tetrarizing, if all this is happening all at once, and our experience is never fragmented like that, then there's an interesting inquiry there to say, how does this waking up and cleaning up relate? Because it's not actually separate in our experience. Even though we might pursue these um, areas and lines of development separately, they're not separate. So that's another thing to consider. And bringing it back uh, to kind of how we talked last week about the four turning, for me, this is all about how can this help me and us serve our practice and our response to the world, to keep tying that back to the embodied lived experience. And we're gonna do that again in this uh, training, at least through waking up, cleaning up, growing up and showing up. So we'll do this practically and experientially. <laughs>